And we're live. Welcome back to the Wheelie Podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Mike Atoll, and I'm joined by Electrek Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. And we've got a pile of interesting new e-bike and e-moto and uh, 1E battle tank story this week. Uh, A whole bunch of interesting things. Harley's got their new electric motorcycle rolling out. Rad's got uh, a big upgrade across the line. Amazon's getting a little wonky with their uh, electric cargo bike program. Um, We've got some cool new data on how much oil electric bikes and other E2-wheelers are displacing. Honda's got their uh, vintage uh, Moto Compo mini motorcycle coming back around this time as an electric version and a bunch more. But uh, where are we going to start this week, Seth? All right. Uh, There's an affordable EV out there displacing twice as much oil as electric cars. Yeah, and you might be able to guess what it is based on the type of podcast you're currently <laughs> listening to. It is uh, an electric bike, or actually all sort of E two wheelers and uh, E three wheelers. There was this interesting study uh, from Bloomberg that looked at uh, how much oil was being displaced by different electric vehicles. Basically, how many um, car and other uh, fossil fuel powered transportation sources were being um, foregone for these types of EVs and the, uh, the total numbers show that two-wheelers and three-wheelers account for the biggest um, sort of displacement of all of that oil being burned. A lot of this is really coming from the Asian markets where uh, electric two-wheelers and electric three-wheelers replace some really polluting, really inefficient uh, motorbikes, uh, mopeds, scooters. If you've ever been to, you know, like Thailand or India, all those tuk-tuks that are going around and and um, you know, just burning tons of, uh, of gas and oil. So that's where a lot of this displacement is coming from. But until this Bloomberg study, I never realized how big the disparity is. And a big part of that is really because, especially in Asia, uh, two-wheelers and three-wheelers dominate the roads. You know, like in the West here in the US or in Europe, we think of cars as the main form of transportation, but in much of the world, four-wheelers are not how most people get around. And so it really shows how big an investment in electrification of two wheelers can actually make a huge impact in the air that we breathe and in the climate that we're, we're all having to, to live with. And in some cases suffer through, um, I mean, if you're, if you're watching here with us on YouTube, you can see these graphs. I mean, it's like, you know, four or five, six times the amount of oil being displaced by electric two and three wheelers compared to passenger cars, buses, vans. In fact, if you add up all the other forms, uh, cars, buses, vans, and trucks, everything, it still doesn't match the oil displaced by two and three wheelers. So to me, this is just sort of um, sort of like affirmation of, of everything that I've believed in is that, you know, pushing these smaller format vehicles, these small EVs really makes a much bigger difference than a lot of us realize. Um, I mean, Seth, I know you and I are kind of like preaching to the choir here about uh, the importance of small vehicles, but but still, I think this is this is great to see. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's uh, kind of a big affirmation. I wonder, um, does this study take into consideration uh, folks who would like normally have a car but have like uh, what I would say upgraded to a uh, electric bike or is it kind of stay like do you stay in the categories here? Yeah, that's a good question. Whether it's people sort of like displacing car by bike kind of thing. I imagine it's fairly um category specific uh-huh. because I, i'm not sure you know the the procedures that would be necessary to sort of like account for that so the, uh, the disparity of, might be even bigger like p- potentially yeah yeah if so, you think about all the cars that you know displaced by an electric bike yeah uh, though i think that that's sort of more of a western from phenomenon i would imagine sure. if, you know having the the luxury of replacing a car to begin with right no it's yeah. great to see um and, you know, like a lot, I think, you know, I don't want to pigeonhole mainstream media, but I think a lot of mainstream media thinks that, uh, you know, electric cars are the, are the future or the way to go. And re- and in reality, it's a mix, but I think a huge part or even a, maybe a majority of that mix is electric bikes, electric uh, motorcycles, scooters, that kind of thing. So Absolutely. this is good it's good that Bloomberg's coming out with this and it's obviously good for us to try to publicize this. Yeah. I think it's a, it's definitely a wake up call for people that don't, you know, realize the, 
the magnitude of these numbers. And it's also like, you know, sometimes very rarely nowadays, but we get people who are like, why are you covering e-bikes? Like just stick with, you know, EVs. And I'm like, eh, EV, EVs includes e-bikes guys. Anyway, moving on here. Uh, Rad Power Bikes announces major update to its entire e-bike lineup. Yeah, and that update is, drum roll please, da, 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 UL listing. Uh, this is becoming a really big deal, and Rad actually slipped this in right under the wire because uh, a few days ago, the New York City ban on non-UL listed e-bikes being sold in the city uh, went into effect. And so um, Rad announced this with a few days to go, and basically all of their bikes that they produce from now on will be UL listed, not just the batteries, but the entire uh, drivetrain of the bike because those are two different UL standards one for lithium ion batteries and one for e bike drivetrains as a whole because that's another big part of this you know, the chargers, the motor, the controller, that kind of stuff. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you order a bike from Rad right now that it will be UL listed, but that everything they're producing from that point, which this was September 12th going forward, is UL listed. So they probably still have some inventory around that isn't UL listed. Uh, some of their bikes already were. Um, I think it wasn't uh, standardized because a lot of their bikes are produced in multiple factories in multiple countries. So um, sort of depends which one you got from where at what time. But at least moving forward now, all of their bikes will be UL listed uh, across the line, which I imagine is just going to become pretty much a standard. I mean, there are other certifications for safety out there besides UL. But it seems like UL is the one that many governing bodies around the U.S. are sort of congregating around. So there's that New York City mandate that six months ago was instituted and just went into effect. Um, many, you know, we've talked about before on, on this podcast that, you know, there are many uh, apartment buildings and, and college campuses and, and other places that are saying, you know, only UL bikes are allowed, that sort of thing. So, um you know, Rad obviously is not the first one in this space. Other companies have done this. Juice's um, stuff is all UL listed. Several others, all the Bosch stuff is UL listed. But there are still other companies out there that that have some or all of their product line that's not yet UL certified. And I have to imagine that after Rad has done it, that everyone else is just going to have to copy it or get left by the wayside. What do you think, Seth? I agree. Uh, you know, this is just something that's going to have to happen, and and it's. It's good for the industry. It's good for safety. Um, I, you know, I don't know what the UL price, you know, uh, what what they're charging to um, to uh, ratify a bike, but um, you know, I think for some of the smaller uh, e-bike manufacturers, this could end up being a problem. Obviously, I don't know how like New York City is going to enforce it. Like, you know, a lot of these are drop ships. Like, are they going to, you know, check check it out at the uh, the at FedEx or are they going to, you know, I, I just don't know how they're going to enforce something like this. Obviously, if you have a bike shop, uh, you need to sell uh, bikes. They can, you know, just stroll by the bike shop and, and make sure all the e-bikes are UL listed. But um, I don't know how they're going to enforce from drop shipping. Anyway, uh, you know, a lot of the problem is, is that the uh, delivery bikes, which are all made by kind of the same group, um, they're not UL listed. And I think that was kind of the bigger point for uh, New York city is to try to get those, those bikes in better, better shape. And then, you know, obviously um, the biggest concern is the fires in the apartment buildings. Um, I don't know that this is going to solve that problem because I think those were hobbyists and, and people who don't necessarily uh, toe the legal line of the law, but you know, this is certainly better than nothing, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a good point. You know, like it's sort of like, uh, you know, gun control that it keeps, you know, uh, all the people who are law abiding citizens are going to, you know, abide by the laws. But those who would have, you know, worked outside the law anyways. I didn't know you were a big Second Amendment guy. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting because, you know, enforcement of this is really the bigger issue as opposed to just having the, these laws on the books. Right. Well, I mean, if it's pushing people to get, uh, you know, their their batteries tested and and, uh, you know, within spec, I think that's a good thing overall. Um, and we should, you know, like you said, um, we should point out that Juiced uh, got theirs uh, done a couple months ago. Um, I think Bosch has had theirs 
uh, a while. for years. Um, I don't know about Broza and Shimano and all those kits. I would imagine most of them are UL listed, um, not just not just the uh, batteries, but also the chargers. But have to look on a case by case. Yeah, I've been meaning to do a uh, an article of these are all the UL listed bikes and just update it, you know, like once a month or something as more companies join the fray. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be cool. Be helpful. Yeah. But at this point, I mean, you know, with Rad doing it, they're kind of a, a city on a hill in the e-bike space. So it's, right. it's just got to be a domino effect now. Yep. All right. Moving on. Why Amazon is apparently closing up shop for its electric cargo bike delivery hub. This one is an interesting story because um, so Amazon has or at least they had an ambitious cargo trike delivery program set up in New York City. They brought in something like, you know, hundreds of these electric cargo trikes and they were going to make it a big part of their deliveries. But in 2021, during the training, apparently one of their employees uh, flipped over a, a trike during like the training and they got cold feet and they just sort of like mothballed the program apparently. And in this picture you see here, this is a whole bunch of those cargo trikes just sort of like rotting on the roof of their cargo hub delivery uh, depot there. And they've been there for months. Um, There's another great picture that I couldn't use because it's from another outlet. But if you click through the via link at the bottom of the post, you'll see it. I had to get the satellite view there from uh, from Google Earth. Um, There's a great picture of all these on the uh, the roof there. And so it looks like uh, now that they've put that building up for lease, that they're not going to be working out of that hub anymore. And there was some discussion of like, does this mean that they're not interested in in cargo bike delivery in New York City anymore? As it turns out, I spoke to multiple people. Um, The first was an anonymous source who has pretty deep uh, knowledge of Amazon's cargo bike uh, delivery setup in New York City. And what they basically told me was, it seems like they're scrapping these trikes, but they're very interested in uh, cargo bike delivery in New York City. So they're still expanding that. Um, it looks like they could potentially be moving to a different format, potentially four wheeled cargo bikes. Um, but they're not, you know, giving up on, on cargo bike delivery in New York. And then, uh, I was actually able to speak to someone a few days later at Amazon, um, who confirmed like, yeah, we're absolutely all in on electric, uh, cargo bike delivery in New York city. So it looks like they're not shutting down cargo bike delivery. They're just getting rid of this massive, uh, bike delivery hub that they have in Manhattan that probably costs a fortune to rent and right now is being used to store a bunch of electric trikes that they're not using because they're not stable enough is uh seems to be the summary here interesting i wonder what they're going to do with all of them they should uh sell them all to upway or something so they can get back on the street yeah or if they just need someone to haul them away i i can take a few yeah exactly yeah, it definitely uh, speaks to the the advantage of four wheeled cargo bikes, though. Yeah, I mean, just four wheel vehicles in general are a little bit more stable. Um, I can't tell. Are they two wheels in the front or two wheels in the back? No, they're two wheels in the back, which is part of that stability problem. Yeah, a uh, problem. All right. Well, maybe they need to go back to the drawing board. I I think the two wheels in the front is a lot more stable. So maybe that's. Yeah. Well, those, uh, those vehicles are seeing there, those are part of their, um, UK fleet, I believe where they do Mm -hmm. have the four wheelers and that's going strong. You know, the Amazon, uh, four wheeler cargo bike delivery in in the UK, I think they're in London and Glasgow and a few other places. And and that seems to be a a really popular program. Cool. All right. Good luck. Good luck there. Uh, Honda, they're bringing back their 1980 or 80s moto compo micro motorcycle but this time it's electric this one makes me so happy so that little motorcycle that you're looking at there next to the uh honda active is that what that car was um is the moto compo that was introduced in 1981 by honda and it's basically a folding motorcycle that fits in a trunk so like you could take it out of your car and and use it in the city you know maybe you drive in from the suburbs you park on the edge of the city and then you use your little folding motorcycle to get around the city it only lasted for two years you can imagine you know having a um two-stroke combustion machine <laughs> in the back of your car is not a great uh oh it didn't smell that idea. great afterwards yeah i mean it's it's barely a good idea to have a combustion 
device in the front of your car, let alone right. another one in your trunk. So uh, that, that didn't last. They did sell like 50,000 of them. If you have one today, they're pretty collectible. But Honda is bringing the idea back, this time electric, with the Moto Compacto. And we had a pretty good idea this was coming. I think like a year ago or so, even on this podcast, we covered some um, patent drawings that we saw from Honda that showed something that looked very much like this. So, um, you know, we knew this would be here, but it's great to see they finally launched it. And it's basically the same idea as the original Moto Compo. It's kind of a, a suitcase or briefcase sized device that the wheels fold into, the handlebar and seat fold into. And it looks kind of like a big, you know, briefcase when it's folded up. But you pop it out, you unfold it in a few seconds, and you've got a totally rideable little mini motorbike. It's basically like a, a seated scooter at this point. The performance is not that impressive. The coolest thing about it is the fact that it exists. It only goes 15 miles an hour. Um, I think the range is something like um, 10 or 12 miles. The motor is 490 watts, which is a weird wattage. It almost seems like that's like an honest, you know, real rating as opposed to all these other companies that just pick the closest round number. Um, so it's, you know, it's not impressive from a technical aspect other than sort of the origami design, which I'm sure is where the price comes from. And that brings me to the the kicker here, which is that it is launching at a thousand dollars, which feels like a lot for a 15 mile an hour seated scooter when it basically gives you the functionality of like a $300 go track scooter. But, you know, obviously you're paying for the, the fancy design here. It's like the sort of Apple of, folding seated scooters i would say with just like how fancy it is you know the the glossy nice rounded corners everything so it's it's a bit overpriced in my opinion but uh, there's a chance i'm gonna have to buy one of these just because of how cool it is I yeah the Could foldability yeah the foldability is really cool here um i don't know that i would necessarily want one of these but it's kind of like uh giving yourself a dinghy for your car Right. Yeah. It's it's uh, that last mile, like if you can't park near, you know, if you're going to a fireworks display and there's, you know, parking for blocks and blocks is packed. You can park far away and, and take this the last mile. I, I can see a use case in that. At, but, you know, at the same time, like just get a three hundred dollar scooter. You're probably in the same boat. This is obviously <laughs> the high end version of that. Um, I, I wonder how it's actually placed in the vehicle. Like, is it flat or is it, you know, on the side? Yeah. So it's only 3.7 inches wide. So wow. I think you just lay it down on its side and it's, I mean, basically your trunk is now 3.7 inches shorter, small, right? Like, yeah. Like that's kind that's, of amazing. I mean, the, the design cool. is, is really cool. You got to give them, you know, props there. Honda did a great job with the design. The performance is crap, but the design is beautiful. Well, I mean, 500, um, 490 yeah i know but 500 ish <laughs> uh watts isn't totally disrespectful like uh we've seen tons and tons of 250 watt motors yeah i mean so that that's a fair point probably the um acceleration is decent but 15 miles an hour is is unfortunate you know like you're gonna hit that 15 mile an hour wall and just be frustrated when everyone's passing you in the bike lane right and i agree with that and that's probably due to um, it's probably governed at 15 miles per hour due to, you know, laws in certain European countries where you can't have a scooter that goes 15 miles per hour. I mean, this is certainly a scooter, not more than a bike. Yeah. If anything, when you look at the sort of like X-ray yeah. uh, view there, it, like it's absolutely a scooter with like a lunchbox wrapped around it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think that will be popular. I think uh Especially if if it's uh, marketed as a you know kind of a car dinghy, uh, I think it'll be you know it'll be a, a nice add-on. And would you say the price was a thousand? Yeah, nine hundred and ninety. Should be sold in uh, Honda and Acura dealerships too. So you know you might actually get one with a Honda. Yeah, I mean, that's it's not. I I, I like of all the thousand dollar options you have for your car, like what's <laughs> going to be more fun than this thing? That's true. Yeah, you get like you know special like uh, power, chrome power heated seats for uh, for a thousand bucks. Right. This is going to be way better than any of that stuff. Maybe you can get like a Honda Goldwing motorcycle, and then this is in one of the like side boxes. 
That would be funny. All right, uh, let's move on. Speaking of motorcycles, Harley's new Livewire Del Mar electric motorcycles begin deliveries in the U.S. This one's pretty exciting too. Um, Harley's, I guess technically it's it's not Harley, it's Livewire, which is a Harley subsidiary, um, or um, you know has majority ownership from Harley. Livewire's newest electric motorcycle is uh, the S2 Del Mar, and it is finally making deliveries. It's been delayed a number of times, but these bikes that have been highly anticipated are finally getting out there. Uh, we got the specs uh, earlier this summer where we learned that um, the range puts it in fairly commuter territory. It's 113 miles of uh, city range, but it's got pretty high performance if you really punch it. It's got a 63 kilowatt motor and it does zero to 60 miles an hour in 3.1 seconds. So it's got pretty similar performance to Harley's uh, or rather Livewire's flagship motorcycle, but it's a lot more affordably priced at about fifteen thousand dollars. I think it's fifteen thousand five hundred. But the coolest thing here is that I was able to talk to uh, one of the first recipients of these bikes. His name is Diego Cardenas. He's a pretty big figure in the Livewire community. He also has a Livewire, um, a Harley Davidson Livewire, the original Harley uh, electric motorcycle, and he was able to share some of his early testing just in like the first two or three days that he had the bike. Uh, he's got a 70 mile commute to work. Oh. And so he, um, he took this and he was, you know, a little worried about how it'd go because it's, it's 113 miles, uh, city range. But when you get on the interstate, you know, that's going to drop. And so what he found was that he was able to do his 70 mile commute, which is he's in Southern California. So it's a mixture of highway and, and urban. Uh, and he rolled into work with a uh, 20% battery left. So, um, pretty, pretty reasonable. Remember, this is a commuter motorcycle. This is not a, you know, coast to coast kind of touring bike. Um, he charged up at work, uh, got up to 90%. And then on the way home, he pushed it a bit harder and he rolled in with 2% battery left. So that's, you know, I would have needed like a, a spare set of riding underwear after that, but <laughs> he seems to, to push it a lot further than I would have been comfortable. Yeah, so they, it was cool. they don't offer a uh, pedal attachment on, on this one. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, let's call a friend or, or push it the last uh, mile or so. Right. But I mean, he, he rolled in under his own power. He said his, uh, his phone was already getting messages from the bike saying like, time to plug me help, in. Sir. Help, right. Yeah. Um, so it was very cool to see just like in the first few days that, you know, there are a lot of people already, um, sharing their, their experiences. That's one of the things that, um, not to like crap on another company here, but you know, when we talk about lightning motorcycles, that is another electric motorcycle dealer or uh, company in, in Southern California that says they've been, you know, putting bikes out for years. We almost never see anyone like post pictures on social media or share, you know, pictures or videos or like hear from riders. I think I know of one, one rider, but here, you know, these live wires, they roll out and there's already like a several hundred strong Facebook group of uh, owners group, the, um, the larger, like all live wire motorcycle Facebook group that Diego actually runs here is like uh, several thousand strong. So it's cool to see that there's such a community around these that, you know, the day or two days after these bikes start making deliveries, we've already started getting, you know, data and stories from owners, which I think is a big, uh, you know, fun part of this. And personally, for my own um, sort of uh, selfish reasons, as a uh, Del Mar reservation holder, I'm excited to see this kind of stuff because I want to know how my bike's going to perform when I get it probably next month. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, when, did, when do you anticipate getting yours? Uh, is it, do you have a date or? Yeah, it should be October. I don't have an exact date yet, um, but they've told me that uh, it should be next month. And that's going to East or West Florida? Uh, probably East Florida. Yeah, okay. that'll be my uh, East Coast ride. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, Some people have a girl in every zip code. I've got a bike in every zip code. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's better, actually. Probably. <laughs> yeah, fewer problems. Yep. 99 fewer. Um, that's that's pretty nice. Uh these come in at thirty thousand dollars, right? No, that that was the original uh, oh. live wire. Yeah, these are fifteen thousand five hundred. Oh, well, these are the launch edition. So technically, these are like seventeen thousand five hundred. The non-launch edition is fifteen thousand five hundred. Oh, that's reasonable. Jeez. Yeah. Right. Like the, when you consider compare it to the original thirty thousand dollar Harley Davidson live wire, and even when the live wire relaunched as the live wire one, which is basically the same bike but under live wire, that one's twenty three thousand. So fifteen thousand five hundred, 
I mean, there are a lot of gas powered Harleys that are more expensive than that. And there, is there a federal tax credit or any kind of tax credit on that? Unfortunately not. Um, huh. Some states do. I think California might still have a, a motorcycle one. There used to be a, a federal motorcycle tax credit. It expired about a year ago. So fortunately, there's not a federal one right now. Uh, bummer. Yeah, right. All right. Well, we'll look forward to seeing uh, some reviews starting in October of your Absolutely. experience there. All right, moving on. BMW stops selling all its motorcycles in U.S. except for electric motorcycles. Yeah, this is wild. I could not believe this when I first saw it. Um, I think I was one of the first to actually cover it. Uh, BMW issued a stop sale for all of its motorcycles uh, in the U.S. for all model years except for electric motorbikes. So... Um, what that means is that there's probably a uh, combustion engine related issue. What they described it as is uh, basically saying to ensure that our vehicles are of the highest industry standards, BMW is performing uh, testing evaluation and following their recent quality analysis. BMW is pursuing measures to further evaluate a material used in the component of its motorcycle evaporative system, which may not have been produced to material specifications. So sounds like uh, a fuel system, potentially something related to emissions because they're only stopping the sale in the U.S. right now, um, not in Europe, uh, not yet in Canada. And so it's almost certainly related to some regulatory issue because that would explain the difference between um, uh, sort of U.S. And, and European emissions regulations. We don't know exactly what it is. Maybe it's something else, but that's where the clues seem to point to. And the fact that their electrics are not affected and that currently the only thing that BMW is selling in the U.S. are electric motorcycles is a big sort of red flag there. Unfortunately, that means there's only that's a good one. thing, though. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a great thing. We'll have to see, you know, once we find out more information here, if these things have been pumping out for years, terrible fumes or right. you know, giving people more cancer than they should have been or, or what the case was. We only wanted a certain amount of cancer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the cool thing is that BMW is, is actually pretty committed to electrics. And so while they only have the CEO four available in the U S right now, they've got mm -hmm. the CEO two coming out pretty soon. So there'll be a second model available. Um, and we've seen patents from BMW on uh, several other higher power electric motorcycles that seem to be in the works. So, uh, if you've been wanting to buy a BMW motorcycle and been sort of debating between electric or uh, or gas, it's it's really easy right now because you only have one option. The decision has been made for you. Yeah, so that's great. You know, and if we're lucky, maybe this will become a, a permanent thing. Right. So uh, uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 strange because obviously BMW, uh, at least BMW Motorrad, makes the majority of its it sales from gas bikes and they should be doing everything they can to ensure that they're compliant there, especially since the fact that they've stopped sale on all models across all model years, new and used. I mean, this seems like it could go pretty deep. I wonder if, uh, they'll just give up on gas. You think? Uh, that Probably sounds not. like a dream. <laughs> not the right time yet. Maybe in a few <laughs> years. Yeah. Yeah. Tell that to their accountants. Right. All right, let's move on. Uh, this awesome $3,000 electric battle tank from China can fit adult-sized riders. This one is uh, <laughs> this is part of our weekly uh, Awesomely Weird Alibaba Electric Vehicle of the Week um, series. And I've found a few tanks before, but this is my favorite because it fits an adult really well. Like, you can see the size there. Like, it's not a kid's toy. It's like a small adults toy which to me is super exciting because it means like i could fit in this thing and it seems to work really well we've got a video here if you're watching along with us where it climbs up a pretty steep hill i mean it's got dual tank treads the weird thing is it's actually controlled with a steering wheel and normally tanks or anything with treads you know construction equipment whatever has two levers yeah so like or if you've ever ridden like a zero turn mower like that's a the standard control mechanism when you've got um, two independently controlled drive wheels or tank treads, but this has a steering wheel. And so there's a fairly uh, complicated system that when you turn the steering wheel, it sort of like um, uh, delivers a differential 
power to the different motors based on how far the wheel is turned, which like actual tanks don't even use. They just have two levers like a lawnmower. <laughs> so kind of impressive from the, the Chinese engineering here in this really cool Alibaba vehicle. I feel like this one fits the title of awesomely weird Alibaba electric vehicle of the week better than, than a lot of the ones. Yeah, the top comment is Russia's putting in an order for thousands already. <laughs> oh, man, I, I wish that wasn't as funny. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm hoping and assuming that, that uh, the turret is for, for appearance sake and not, not, of course, connected to some sort of ammo. Oh, yeah, so I had some fun with that. Where is it? Um, uh, oh, shoot, where is it? It's in, oh, yeah, here he is. The craziest thing about it, though, is that the main cannon is fully functional for firing armor-piercing rounds. Just kidding. I think it's a painted piece of PVC pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Though, actually, the, we the wildest thing about it truly is the massive battery pack. It's 72 volts and 200 amp hours. Do the math. What is that in kilowatt hours? 14.4. It's written Jeez, there. Jeez, that's a that. uh, motorcycle small, uh, small four-wheeler uh, yeah. size. That was actually for a long time. That was Zero's like standard battery pack size was fourteen point four kilowatt hours. Um, I'm sort of thinking that the price here, three thousand bucks, is batteries not included. Yeah, it's a very common way to do it on Alibaba, where like they tell you at the last minute, like, "Oh, you want batteries?" and then the price goes up. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I think you know, if if you had to buy a motorcycle battery of that size in the U.S., you'd pay more than three thousand dollars. Right. So I'd be impressed if that. Uh, if you get that, but, um, you know, if, even if you have to spend an extra thousand or 2000 bucks, I mean, I don't know where else you're getting a electric tank. That's this impressive, you know, like actually has this much power and climbing capacity for that little, even if the technically probably has a PVC pipe painted green on the front of it for the turret. And, and what is like, uh, we're looking on the screen at, at some of the controls on the front. I see like, there's a, looks like an iPad <laughs> on a steering wheel, but, um, like a Tesla. Yeah. Um, what do you think these other things do? Like, I, I imagine that I, I'm hoping that, that that doesn't point the turret or anything like that. What What do these things do, you think? So it's funny because there definitely is a multi-directional joystick there. But uh -huh. the only thing I can imagine is that it aims the turret. Maybe wow. it's fake because... Maybe it's for like bottle rockets. That would be amazing. Even if it just had something, yeah, or like little fireworks or something. Yeah, Roman candle. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but they, you're right. There are a lot of controls there. Like, there shouldn't be that many things. Maybe there's, like, countermeasures and you know, the little SMG hatch opens up. Okay. I might have to. I, I shouldn't, but I might have to get one of these. That's a really <laughs> bad idea. I might do it. <laughs> yeah, you got to just come up with a reason. Get a, get a container ship full. Sell them, sell them at uh, Toys R Us. Yeah, this is really bad, but I might do this. <laughs> All right. Final story of the week uh this is my just under the wire uh review of the talaria xxx or triple x um a super fun emoto that defies categories is the current title but um the original title was is so fun it should be legal uh, <laughs> because the uh legality of a bike like this is really in question and we don't quite know exactly where this fits in obviously you can buy them on uh, lunacycle.com um, they're always sold out uh, they announce on Facebook uh, when when you can get them so it, it's an incredible bike um, I uh, you know it's almost too incredible like it's just so much fun to ride uh, I feel bad that I'm not pedaling like I, I enjoy the pedaling the exercise but you know this thing's so dang fun um, so we got this about a month ago um, you know I I kept it at 30 miles per hour so Luna has this kind of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge uh, thing where it says, you know, this is a bike that, you know, out of the box is legal to sell. You know, it goes 20 miles per hour on eco mode and in sport mode, it'll go almost 30 miles per hour, which kind of puts it into, you know, class two or class three for um, e-bikes. Obviously, there's no pedals that come with this, though you can buy aftermarket pedals if that oh, you can. Yeah. Uh, the, and uh Let's, I think I can, I got a link in here. Uh, it's the Kani Tawa. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the pedal kit. You can get that today. It's oh, a that's hilarious. 200 bucks. Um, like, you know, there's 
they're obviously just uh, vestig- vestigial. What do we call those things? Vestigial, yeah. Vestigial uh, pedals. <laughs> but, um, you know, that'll, you know, when the cop pulls you over and says, this is not a freaking e-bike, you can say why it's got pedals and it <laughs> tops out under 30 miles per hour as a class three e-bike. And then you guys can have the debate from there. Um, but you know how that goes. Yeah, that's, I mean, the pro- I think the main problem with this thing, uh, as far as the police are concerned, is it doesn't look like an e-bike. Uh, it looks like a, a, a light motorcycle, and that's kind of what it is. Um, Luna is selling it, like I said, you know, with, with specs that make it legal in a lot of areas. Um, you know, Luna says this is only for off-road usage. Um, it tops out at 20 to 30 miles per hour. You are not supposed to do anything, but like, you know, in all the forums are like, just cut the brown wire. It'll go up to 50 miles per hour uh, in sport mode. Um, wow. And, you know, that that's verifiable. Like uh, there's plenty of videos on the web about it. Um, so uh, for this review, however, I wanted to keep it legal, keep it as it came. And I wanted to let my son ride it, who's uh, 14, going to be 15 here in a few days. Um, I wanted to make, you know, make it so that, you know, it's basically, he's riding a class three e-bike. Um, and he took it to school a few times where we were super nervous about it, but, um, uh, for the most part, he was, uh, you know, pretty safe with it. Um, and you know, like obviously it accelerates qu- quite a bit faster than a typical e-bike, but it doesn't, um, you know, once you hit 28 miles per hour or whatever, it kind of stops, uh, accelerating so um you know it fits it fits the description even though that zero to 28 miles per hour is way faster than any, any e-bike we've ever reviewed <laughs> um so what do you think about this thing yeah so to me i mean so first of all it looks like it's got like street motorcycle tires basically right, right? yeah enduro so tires. that's sort of like a, a big differentiator between most surons that come with off-road tires and they make it easier to say this is like an off-road bike that's why it goes 45 50 miles an hour so it, it makes the gray area here kind of grayer in a grayer way. yep so to me that that's interesting um but yeah you definitely get into that that debate about this weird um like you know, class four, whatever you want to call it on, you know, out of class e-bikes and, and that really gray area between bikes and motorcycles to me. I mean, if there are going to be people riding sort of out of class e-bikes, I'd rather see them on something that looks as well built as this. I mean, it seems like from what, you know, you said and looking at it here, it seems like a quality built machine, you know, that they've built it more like a motorcycle. For sure, one of these, you and know, then like that, you know, the chain and, and the brakes are all motorcycle specs, two twenty millimeter uh, brake rotors. Um, yeah. the chain is like, you know, heavy duty. Uh, it's not like an e bike uh, chain that's gonna melt through those sprockets when the <laughs> fork gets pretty high. Yeah, like I, I can see this destroy a a bike chain. So I mean, yeah. there there are always gonna be be people out there that are riding out of class e-bikes and so i guess i would rather see them on something higher quality like this so that you know it's not going to fall apart in front of somebody and they get run over because their bike disintegrated on them because it was using bicycle components to go 45 miles an hour but you know you you get into that debate of you know should we be policing this stuff should we be you know regulating that sort of thing which I got to tell you, I still don't know how I feel about that. I go back and forth every day. You know, I'm so like pro e-bike, but at the same time, you know, like we need rules to keep us and everyone else safe. This is a tricky one for me. I don't know. I'm having my own arguments with myself. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Um, You know, some some folks like on the Facebook uh, user group um, got it, uh, got a DMV license plate uh, as a motor uh, moped in California. So nice. um, that's certainly one way to go about it. Although I don't think uh, California uh, licenses 50 mile per hour mopeds. Um, I, I believe that the specs were, were probably given at 20 to 30 miles per hour. Yeah. I think the limit in California for a moped is 30, if I'm not mistaken, um, yeah. for like a moped classification. So they probably left in the, you know, stock or said it was in stock. Right. Settings. Right. 
and you know if you go on to the uh the channel or on the uh you know facebook groups or whatever like pretty much nobody uh left the uh brown wire untouched sadly yeah. um, or or whatever i don't know i'm you know i'm not passing judgment here i just uh my concern is so these are so cool and so fun that i think a lot of people i think this is going to be like i don't want to say like super 73 level of you know attention but i think it's going to be quite popular and i think there's going to be people who abuse it they go 50 miles per hour on bike trails and they go 50 miles per hour on 30 mile per hour streets and they zip in and out of traffic and i think that's going to get these things like hit hard by law enforcement and and maybe even you know you know some new laws that get enacted because of these things um, so I don't know what you do about this because, like, clearly it's nice to have great acceleration, um, especially, you know, if you're going up a hill and you're on a 30 mile per hour road, it's it's certainly nice to be able to ride with cars instead of have cars going around you. But on the other hand, like the potential for these to be abused and, you know, like they're, they're just going to piss people off. Like, I, I know how this is this story is going to end. Um, I just, it's just sad because like, it's such a good commuter vehicle. Like it's, it's so much fun to take around, but you know, the, the battery on this thing's huge. It's 2.4 kilowatt hours. Um, it'll take you 50 miles, you know, if you're going 30 miles per hour, like I was going or more, um, it's just a really like compelling vehicle. And, um, you know, it, it and the components all around are solid. You can see the, um, the speedometer here, which the um, the readout is a little bit small for my eyes. If you have uh, if you don't need glasses to read, you're going to be in good shape. Um, the um, the charger is 10 amps, so they didn't cheap out on the charger at all. Um, it, it'll go from totally dead to totally full, 60 miles of range in under four hours. So nice. I mean, even like a, a long lunch break will add 25 20 25 miles to the the range, um, and certainly you know it would charge up at, at over a work day or even half a work day. Um, so I don't know. It's just like, I, I don't know how, how this ends. Um, I do imagine that uh, Luna is probably facing some, you know, this is obviously coming from China. Talaria is they're, they're quite popular in Europe already, um, but they're just kind of hitting the shores here. Um, Sur, it, you know, squarely falls in Suron territory. We've seen Suron's, um, on bike trails, people hate them on the streets because, you know, they're, they don't belong there. This is kind of the same boat. So I don't, you know, I don't know where this ends up. Um, I would love to hear like, uh, if, if people are listening put your comments in the, uh, uh, comment area about it, maybe we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more there. Um, but I will say like, regardless of legality, this is a phenomenal fun, uh, e-bike, um, you know, it's and the components are like I said, like amazing. Like the light, super bright. They've it's got regen. So like, you know, to have a mid drive uh, motor have regen, it means that the uh, the chain is still going while you're not uh, accelerating. So um, it actually regens, at, and it regens so hard that like even if you're going down a steep hill, you don't need to use the brakes almost ever. Um, once you're below like ninety percent charge, that is. So it's got it's just got so many really high end features that um, it's almost a shame that it's it's uh, you know quasi legal um, and you know those those issues come up so, so uh, yeah yeah I feel like I don't want to put words in your mouth but I feel like we're both in a similar position where like we like that it exists and that it's there for the people who can handle it but we're uncomfortable that there are people that shouldn't have it have it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. So let's jump into a few of the comments here. Um, let me uh, shut this down real quick. All right. Anthony Layton, looking forward to the ride reviews of the new Honda. Uh, did we call Honda yet? Do we have a uh, review scheduled? So there's a good chance I'm going to be getting on one in uh, like the third week of October or so. Wow. They go on sale in November, and I think I'm going to be able to to get on one a bit earlier. Nice. I wonder if those would be easier to put on a uh, airplane as well. 
The battery's uh I think above the 160 watt hour limit, unfortunately. So right. easy to put on, legal to put on, I'm not sure. Okay. And could you take the battery carry on or send it? No, that's no. that's the the carry on limit is one sixty. Yeah. Okay. I think you're not even allowed to put one sixties in your checked bag. Right. All right, Extra Hero, would it be possible to make it so that all new e-bikes sold on Amazon and eBay to be UL listed? So I I thought that there was a requirement, if I'm not mistaken, for Amazon that they're supposed to be UL listed, and I think a lot of them aren't. But, for example, um, I believe the um, electric XP Lite is the only electric bike that's sold on Amazon, and so that one is UL listed for that reason. Huh. Um but I thought that there is some requirement that like might not be enforced kind of thing, at least for Amazon. Right. eBay might be a little more wild west. Yeah, that's usually the case, <laughs> especially since they sell a lot of used stuff as well. All right. Uh, Skeeter Magoo says Amazon. So we're talking about the uh, the, um, the cargo trikes. trikes. Yeah. yeah, the cargo trikes. Uh, Amazon needs to offer those trikes to other cities. Uh, yeah. I mean, they they still got good life in them for some fun. Yeah, and may, maybe maybe get the uh, that the people who can ride three wheelers without tipping over. Although, like now that I think about it, I have a hard time staying on two or on three wheels without a big cargo thing. Uh, that seems yeah. a little scary with a cargo thing back there. I uh, wouldn't widening the rear, rear wheels on those Amazon trikes prevent tipping. Um, it would certainly help, but I then you start sort of getting into like the car width. And yeah. And actually uh, New York city uh, has a limit. I think it's 36 inches on the width of uh, cargo bikes to be used in bike lanes. And they're actually discussing increasing that to 48 inches. And this is perhaps one of the reasons that, you know, you can become a little more stable with those trikes. All right. Uh, moped is a hundred watt or something too. So yeah, uh, we're not even close there. Um, this is, uh, so the, sorry, the, um, Polaria X, X, X is six kilowatt, uh, peak. So <laughs> not close and three, three, uh, nominal, but really that six kilowatts is the usual mode. Uh, extra hero. If you've ever watched an Apple TV show, they're big on futuristic technology that looks futuristic. And that's the only responsible reason to ever buy one of those Honda e-scooters, <laughs> LOL. I mean, uh, we're not the only, but definitely I think some people are going to buy it for looks alone. Yeah. And I, I have to, like, I have to say, like, it's compelling to have a very small package that, you know, could fit in your car. Like, especially if they made like a, a slider for it. Um, yeah. Well, that's actually have... a good point. Cause like, if you like a folding scooter, you know, you can put that in your trunk, but it's going to get caught on everything, you know, the handlebars, exactly. whatever the wheels. All right. Regarding the Talaria, uh, this UGF, they are motorcycles, in my opinion. A lot of people are going to have that same opinion. Um, I mean, I guess this debate has been going on for a long time with the Surons, uh, the Light B. Um, and this is the Talaria is a lot lighter, though. It's 125 pounds, which I don't know if you remember um, the. Uh, Jeez, I can't remember the name. The ones that you, you had in Vermont. Those are... Oh, the, the big dog. Yeah, the Hemaway big dog. Yeah, yeah. Hemaway big dogs. I, those are pretty close to 125 pounds. So it's interesting to me that um, they got this, you know, huge battery, 2.4 2 kilowatt hour battery, pretty big motor, like motorcycle kit uh, down to 125 pounds when there's e-bikes that are in that same category. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend taking them up you know, a few flights of stairs, like if you have, <laughs> have an apartment like that, that this is not the vehicle for <laughs> Carry you. Carry straps. Right. Uh, you know, maybe once in a while you could bring it up. Um, also, the battery is not super uh, easy to remove. So uh, apartment dwellers aren't really the uh, target audience here. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, Extra Hero, just a reminder to ask Specialize to send over one of the Globe Halls for review purposes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We're working on, on that. On the way? All right. Yeah. And then finally, uh, at what point does an e-bike become an e-motorcycle? And, oh, man. How long do you have? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's the debate we're having here. Like, I I just don't know what to say about it. Because, like, on one hand, it's fun. It's compelling. Like, I, 
I just I I think it's just too much power. It's too I mean, I will say for me, like I'm trying to be responsible, but I just want all the power and I want to go really fast. <laughs> and like if I can't control myself, how can I expect other people to control themselves with it? Uh so I think it is like I I, I kind of fall on the this has to be a motorcycle. This has to be homologated. I mean, even as a moped, fine. Like say it's a moped like limit it probably even more so than the uh, brown wire trick um you know make it make it homologated uh for roads so that people you know understand they see a little license plate on it theoretically there's some sort of uh training or testing going on you can't just hop on one of these things um but like i'm kind of falling in that category even though you know i have one downstairs and i'm probably going to jump on it later and ride it you know illegally so <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I think that's well said. I think you, you summed it up very well there. All right, and that's all for the comments. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I think this was a great episode, lots of really interesting stories, and I'm excited to see what we will have another two weeks from now when we're back with the next episode of the Wheelie Podcast.